Good morning, everybody. It's good to be here this morning with you guys. We are um, continuing on a series this morning called Mine, M-I-N-E, and every week we're going to make some cheesy adjustment to that word uh, uh, to guide us in our conversation. And so last week we talked about how we kind of want to think everything is ours, like it, like it, like it belongs to us. And we need to be reminded of this truth that, that all I have has come, by the way, come my way by the loving hand of God. And this week, we're going to expand upon um, those ideas, those thoughts, the, those, that, that, that train of thinking. But this week, we're going to talk about a different mine, and that's a landmine. The explosive things that we can step on along the way that can hurt us. And by hurt us, I mean that can separate us from God and separate us from the joy that he meant for us to experience. A lot of us think that that, that money or the thing money can buy can bring us some sort of happiness in our lives or, or a joy in our lives. But Scripture tells us that that's not the case. That what we're talking about is really a battle of desires between things, stuff, or God. Scripture tells us that, that, that we can't serve two masters, that we can't serve both God and money. And so we're looking today at uh, uh, some of the, the money landmines so that we can heed that warning and avoid those landmines and we can experience all the joy and that God has for us in our relationship with him. But we're going to start in maybe a, a, an unusual place, somewhere that maybe, for those of you who've been around church and maybe have heard a message like this before, uh, wouldn't necessarily go to first in your mind. But uh, as I was praying about this message this morning, this is where God took me. And, uh, and so we had to rearrange the service a little bit on the fly and rearrange, like, the slides um, and so, uh, thank you uh, for being patient with some of the some of the some of the scriptures will be up there, and some of them might not be because <laughs> they weren't all in the original outline for this message. Uh, tur- open up your Bibles or turn with me this morning to Exodus. Exodus, the story of the Israelites being brought out of slavery in Egypt. We are going to look at Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. If you guys want to go there in your Bibles or turn on your devices and find that. We're looking at this passage because it's probably mostly a forgotten little detail of this story. The book of Exodus is mostly about God rescuing the Israelite people from slavery to the Egyptians and bringing them out, right, an Exodus, bringing them out of that that nation so that they could become this new nation of God, God's chosen, holy, set-apart people. But it was a journey to get there, and it took the hand of God to make it happen. And so when we start the story, somewhere in between the burning bush, God speaking to Moses and giving Moses some instructions, and then later on Moses saying, Pharaoh, let my people go, like like as in the, the... the you're going to now experience plagues and all kinds of stuff like that because you're not letting them go. There's this other request in the middle. And you might not remember it, but I think it's kind of funny. When Moses first goes to Pharaoh, he asks for PTO. He asks for just a vacation for the Israelite people. Let's look at it in in Exodus chapter 5. It says, afterward, so that's after the burning bush and after Moses gets to Egypt and he talks to his brother Aaron about this is what God says the plan is. So that afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and says, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go so they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. He's not saying let my people go as in we're never coming back. His initial request of Pharaoh is, can I take these guys on a camping trip? 
Can we go for a vacation? Can we go hold a festival to God? If, if you read on, and I encourage you to do so, later on um, in, in the same passage, he says, like, we're going out there to, to sac- make sacrifices to God and to worship him. He was just, the first request was just simply, can, can these people leave their job so that they can go take some time to worship God? That was the initial request. Now, God knew that he was not going to say yes to this because what this really was is a provocation of Pharaoh. God was poking at him. God told Moses before, they, before this happened that he was going to harden Pharaoh's heart, meaning he was going to pick a fight with Pharaoh in a way that Pharaoh would bristle and kind of puff his chest out a little bit so that God could show that God really was the one true God. You see, Pharaoh thought he was God. And I'm not just saying that in a philosophical sense. Like, they claimed in front of their people that, that Pharaohs were descended from gods or were even God themselves. And so that was, that was Pharaoh's position. Like, like, he said, you have to do what I say because I am God. Like, he claimed to, like, make supernatural things happen because of his deity. And God's poking at him because he's saying, hey, let these people go worship another God. They need to stop building your kingdom because the Israelite people were making bricks at the time. They were building storehouses and all kinds of infrastructure for Egyptian life, right? And he's like, I need them to stop building your kingdom and go worship mine. I want them to go have some fun. I want them to go experience joy in their relationship with me out in the desert. And Pharaoh, Pharaoh responds in verse 2. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. It's like, dun, dun, dun. Because Pharaoh didn't believe our truth from last week, that all I have has come my way by the loving hand of God. Instead, he thinks, no, I am God. And so begins a story. The plagues come, the Israelites leave Pharaoh and the Egyptians. They leave the the, the nation of Egypt. They head out into the desert on their way towards the promised land, towards Israel. And God had to spend 40 years training them to become his people, training them to become the people of God, training them to become the nation that he needed them to be. Now, part of that 40 years was a consequence for them not trusting God, but I believe he always knew that was going to happen too. Like, he, he just knows their hearts. He knows that, like, they're going to need to experience his provision, his protection, to really get to know God and know his nature so that they can live as his people. And so God takes them out into the desert. And turn with me now to Exodus chapter 16. A couple pages over here. Exodus chapter 16. We're going to look at uh, verse 2 says, in the desert, so now they're out there. They haven't been out there long because the food they brought with them out of Egypt is just running out. So they couldn't have carried much, okay? They didn't have like freeze-dried backpacker meals back then, all right? They get out there. They've just sang the song, worshiping God about how he parted the Red Sea. They're camped out. And it says, in the desert, Chapter 16, verse 2. In the desert, the whole community grumbled, underline that word, or highlight that word, or circle it, or something like that. They grumbled against Moses and Aaron. They had just witnessed the plagues of Egypt, God's mighty hand conquering the Egyptians and, and, and shutting down any claim that any of their gods had any power. Because each one of the plagues was an affront to one of the gods that they worshipped. They had just witnessed that. Then 
they go out in to, to the desert, they watch God part the Red Sea. And they watch the Red Sea come back and cover up the Egyptian army, conquering their pursuers. And now they're grumbling. They're whining. They're complaining against Moses and Aaron. And if you read on later, just a few chapters later, it says their grumbling turns to the Lord too. Verse 3, the Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this, this entire assembly to death. You've brought us out here to starve. They start, they instantly, as soon as they're out there, start comparing their old life, their old standard of living to this new life they have with God. Now, I tend to be kind of harsh on these guys. I'm like, you guys just watched the miracles. Some days I feel like I would give anything. I need God's direction. I would give anything for like, a, a pillar of cloud or a, or a pillar of fire so I would know which way to go and what to do. And they've got it, and they're grumbling. They're comparing their old life to where they are now. We always have this selective memory. We always have this selective memory where we only remember the good parts. They don't remember that their lives were literally defined by how many mud bricks they could form in a day. And if they didn't, they would be severely punished or even killed, right? That, that is demeaning. Oh, you can't produce this many bricks in a day. You're useless. You're gone. And they had lived for 400 years that way. They'd lived for 400 years kind of with that type of thinking just beat into and repeated in their psyche. Repeated and repeated and repeated. You're only worth what you can produce. You're only worth what you can produce. And that, that, that evil master of theirs who provided that food for them in those pots that they're talking about, all the food we wanted, pots of meat, that evil master, when, when they asked to go worship God, said, we're going we're gonna to take away the straw that helps bind and hold those bricks together. So now as you labor, you're going to labor in vain, right? You're going you're gonna to labor, and for every two steps forward, you're going to take one step back because those bricks as they dry are going to crack and crumble and fall apart because they don't have straw, the binder, to hold them together. So you're going to have to work even harder. And then later on, as the, as the plagues progressed, he even doubled their quota, which basically cuts their wages in half, if you will. You're going to do twice the amount of work for the same amount of pay. But we only remember the good stuff. We only remember how good it used to be. We don't remember always the bad stuff. It's a, it's a problem humans have. Like psychologists have studied this, of like this selective memory. Sometimes we only remember the bad stuff and we don't remember the good stuff. But, but we do this to justify what we want. And right now in the story, they want food. And so we're going to justify what we want. And they grumble against the Lord. If we read between the lines a little bit, are the Israelites happy right now? Or are they miserable? If you're grumbling, you're miserable. But they brought it upon themselves. They brought that misery upon themselves. Just in their minds. Allowing their thought process to go a certain way. They brought it upon themselves because they could be focused on thanking God for all the amazing miracles he has just done. They could be praising him, still praying for provision, but praising him for the protection and the provision that they have experienced thus far. And instead they grumble. This sounds pretty familiar. And I don't say that proudly because it sounds familiar because this is me. And that's probably you too if we're honest with ourselves. 
we want what we want. And we will even have a selective memory about the past or tell ourselves a new story about our present in order to justify us getting what we want. Right? I deserve this. Oh, it's been a long, hard week. And so I need this right now. Right? Or, or it's on sale today, and so if I get this today, it'll, it'll save me money in the future. We justify what we want. And in the process, in the process, we can, we can actually choose the wrong master. We can shackle ourselves to the wrong master because we have all the wrong desires. There's a really great book that I want to recommend to you guys, and, we, and I have a quote from that book that we're going to put up here. It's called Money, God or Gift by Jamie Munson. And in this book, the, the main, and this is me kind of evaluating or reviewing the book, the main, the main push of this book is who and what do you desire? Do you desire money and, and the kind of security that can bring, or do, you, or do you desire God and the kind of security, peace, joy that only he can bring? And this is a quote that he had, and it says, despite the warning, talking about warnings from Scripture, it says, the temptation to spend, spend, spend is so strong that many of us close the shackles around our own wrists meaning we enslave ourselves to the wrong master, a master who doesn't love us, doesn't care about us, only uses us for what that master can get back from us. We enslave ourselves to the wrong master. Despite all these warnings. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. Hundreds of years later, now Israel's in the promised land, Things should be going good, but there's a, there's a king, Solomon, who's very wise, and he's writing down all of these proverbs, these wisdom sayings, because of what he's learned, what he's experienced, the wisdom given to him by God. And he says this, the rich rule over the poor, Proverbs 22, verse 7, the rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. You see, when those Israelites were grumbling and saying, hey, back in Egypt, we had meat in pots that we could eat. They were saying we would rather be enslaved to Pharaoh, or at least I'd have a hot meal tonight, than experience all the freedom and blessing that God is offering us, all the joy of a relationship with him. Remember, God's the one who is trying to invite them to go out to the desert and have a big festival and a big party. And Pharaoh wouldn't let them go. But they're not remembering that. They're, they want to enslave themselves to a master because of what they want and because they want it now. We live in an instant gratification society where we're no different. We want it, and we want it now. And we're willing, if we're honest with ourselves, to enslave ourselves to the wrong master for gratification. For an instant gratification. Let me drop this idea on you guys. Could you drop everything right now? Like, if God pushed you and nudged you in this space this morning, so you hadn't planned for it, you hadn't put in a PTO request or anything like that. Could you drop everything this morning and head off for a week of worshiping God if he asked you to? Because that's how, that's how it happened for the Israelites. They didn't really have a choice. It was Pharaoh's choice. But that's how it happened for the Israelites. This guy, Moses, shows up. He has a meeting with his brother Aaron. And he's like, hey, we're going to go ask to take all the Israelites off to go worship. Today, could you drop everything and leave and go worship God for a week? There's really two parts to this question. 
Could you and would you want to? The first part, could you, many of us feel like we can't step away from work. We feel like, man, if, I, if I'm not there tomorrow, balls will be dropped. Right? The plates won't keep spinning. Or, or my boss is going to be ticked. Or my paycheck's going to be withheld. And then we're afraid because we have loans on all kinds of stuff these days that something might be repossessed. Anything that you have a loan on, you don't fully own, right? Alyssa and I were on vacation. We're in Hawaii, this beautiful, unbelievable, magnificent place, and we're walking along, and it's kind of romantic and stuff like that. And then this tr tow truck just comes ripping up, and he's repossessing a car right here. <laughs> and it can, it can, that bank can take it back in a minute because they're the master that owns that asset, that can recall it if you aren't serving them the way they want you to. Your house can disappear if you don't keep paying the bank the way they want you to. It's a hard pill to swallow. It's a very hard pill to swallow. But the other half of that question of could we drop everything and worship for a week, the other half of the question is would you want to? Do you desire God, your relationship with him, all that you could experience in his presence, do you desire him in a way where it wouldn't matter what the consequences were, that you would drop everything to go worship him? The Israelite people, when they get to the promised land, have instructions from God that starts right there around those same chapters in Exodus and are, and are even expanded upon again in Leviticus and Deuteronomy for them to worship God through seven festivals every year. Like God set these people apart so that they could experience him in a profound way that would be attractive to everybody else. He's like, these people are going to party. He wanted them to take off work to set aside their responsibilities for these seven festivals every year. And I'm not just talking about like, oh yeah, we have the Christmas season. It's going to be wonderful. We just started putting up our Christmas lights on Friday so that we can enjoy the Christmas season. We're not going to turn them on until after Thanksgiving. But we wanted to get an early jump so we can enjoy the Christmas season. But if I'm honest with you guys, like there's been years where I miss Christmas or I miss Easter. Like, yes, I you know, did all the right things, but I was working so hard that I never got to enjoy them. I never got to enjoy my, my, my family, my church, God in the midst of that season. And so God set aside time for the Israelites where he's like, I want you guys to come and to party with me. I want you to come and spend time and worship with me in a way that just brings this joy to your life that's so attractive that everybody else around is going to want in. Because everybody else is working their butts off. They're stressed. They're panicked. They're worried. They're making all these sacrifices to these false idols. And you guys are going to be like, hey, we're going to take off some time and go for a three-week vacation to Jerusalem and party. It's different, right? And I ask myself, like, how did they do that? There are two feasts every year that were pilgrimage feasts, meaning that if you lived you know, in southern Israel or northern Israel or something, that, that meant you were pretty far from Jerusalem. Like, you might be a week's journey on foot away from Jerusalem, and you were required to be there as part of the way you honored God. And so you had to take off maybe three weeks, because it's a week-long festival once you get there. So you got a week to get there, a week-long festival, a week afterwards. You had to take off that time. It was going to cost you a bunch of money. I don't know if you've ever spent a week, like, on a Hawaiian vacation, but it costs some money. <laughs> it costs you quite a bit. And so he, that, per, that person's going to miss, that family's going to miss three weeks of work, plus a big party in the middle, plus travel costs. And then they would do it multiple times a year. They would have these big parties. How did they do that? Their whole paradigm was different. All of their priorities were different than ours so that they could experience the joy of walking with God and all that he had for them. 
God didn't want us to be a slave to somebody or something, some desire other than that, that, would, that would be this landmine in our life that would, we'd step on it and take us out of the game, away from God. He wanted us to live with joy. He wanted us to live with a lot of joy in our lives. So our truth for today, we can throw this up on the screen, truth number two here, is that we must learn to live joyfully. I must learn, learn to live joyfully within God's current provision for my life. That's how they did it. That's how they did it. When we get ourselves into debt, debt is a huge landmine, but really it's just us saying, I want to find another master who can provide for me the things that I want now. And when we get into that kind of debt, there's now somebody else who has demands on my time, my efforts, my energy, my devotion that can take me away from God. And it brings a whole lot of stress to our lives. It brings a whole lot of difficulty because the truth is that the economy goes up and, up and down. And so there might be times when, oh yeah, I can make those payments, no problem. And then in the next season, you might unexpectedly lose your job or, or sales may go down or whatever. And, and now you're super stressed. And now what you thought was provision might even be something taken away from you. And we don't like to think about those things. It's, it's tough and it's hard to think about, but we got to address that. God would love for us to be free, like debt free. Alyssa and I, did the Dave Ramsey course when we were engaged. And we went on a journey to become debt-free. And, and we're still on that journey. We're still on that path. We're still following his, his, his seven baby steps, his financial plan. But we're on that journey. And I can tell you that we've been extremely blessed because of that journey. In the first like two years of our marriage, we paid off all debt outside of our house. And when God asked us to step away from our jobs to pursue seminary and things to become a pastor, we could say yes. Because we'd minimized the other masters. It was, it was a radical thing for us. Like, we had, we had moments growing up and, 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 you know, experiences and things like that that told us, like, oh, you'll always have a car payment or... Or you'll be paying off school loans for this much of your life or, or things like that. And if we were, we would have never been able to say yes to God and what he asked us to do. And we didn't know that that was the plan. We just were, we just were getting out of debt. We, we just got really passionate for a, seri for a, for a, a small season of our lives about, hey, we're going we're gonna to get out of debt and then we're going to you know, see where we can reprioritize, where we, where we spend that money. I mean, think about how much you spend, if you have debt, on that debt service, the, the percentage of interest you're paying. Often, when you're paying a mortgage payment, the way the amortization schedule works, at the beginning of that 30 years, almost 100% of your payment every month is just interest. How much could you enjoy a celebration with friends and family with, if you had your mortgage payment in your bank account every month? How much could you give to God's kingdom, foreign missions, the needy, the poor, that friend who is struggling, if you had a mortgage payment in your bank every month? That's how they did it. See, God gave them land to live on, so they didn't have mortgage payments. They even had, in the Levitical law, had a, a provision where every 49 years, there was a year of jubilee, and all debts were forgiven. He even encouraged them not to give loans to their fellow Israelites, so that even if your fellow Israelite was making a, a choice that maybe wasn't in their best interest, you wouldn't be party to that by actually helping them and giving, or, or like, profiting from them and giving them that loan. 
was just, it was a warning, not a command, but that was part of just their whole paradigm. And it, it, there's not like, it, I'm not saying that we're, you know, sinning against God by having a loan on our house or something like that. I'm just talking about desire today. Desire and, and, and where our desires lead us to. And I'm trying to warn us against stamping on the landmines and allowing some of our desires to lead us away from God and experiencing all he has for us. I want to remind us of that truth again. I must learn to live joyfully within God's current provision for my life. Joyfully, not grumbling. It's the opposite, joyfully. A lot of people think that like God's this cosmic buzzkill or that somehow he's going to tell us what to do with our money in a way that just like takes the fun out of it all or sucks that all away. And the truth is he wants us to experience joy. Joy. He wants us to steward our money, not our money to have some sort of control over us. He wants us to have a desire for him and not let our desires enslave us to something else. He wants us to choose him and not choose some other master to provide for us. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. Paul's going to teach us how we do this how we live joyfully in our circumstances. Philippians chapter 4, verse 10 through 13 says, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned. You were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Pause right there. The backstory of what's going on right here is that Paul hit up the Philippian church for money. He, he, he asked them, will you help support the, the, the Jewish Christians who are in Jerusalem because they were being persecuted? They couldn't, they couldn't like, keep their homes. They couldn't find work. They couldn't, they couldn't survive because they were being persecuted because, for their faith so strongly at that time. And so Paul says, hey, will you guys help support me financially while I journey to Jerusalem to support that church, and I want to take a large gift, a large offering to them to help support them financially so that they can keep spreading the gospel and keep being a light in that place. That's what he's talking about in this opening sentence. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. He's talking about, you know, their financial help for him. He says, indeed, you were concerned because they were also concerned for themselves because they were under quite a bit of heavy taxation from the Roman government as well. But you had no opportunity to show it. Their joy for what God was doing never let on that they might be concerned for their own finances, never let on that they might not have enough today, but they were going to trust God for tomorrow. Let's go on in verse 11. It says, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Remember, Paul was like, he was shipwrecked. He was snake bit. He was imprisoned. He was beaten. He was on the run for years of his life, being persecuted for, for his faith and for him spreading the gospel. So tell us, Paul, what's the secret of being content? Verse 13, he says, I can do all things, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. This is a bumper sticker kind of a verse. <laughs> It's one that's used like on the football field to say, hey, we can win this game, we can do this, we can take this victory. What he means is that we can actually be content. I can do all the things God has asked me to do. I can, I can still enjoy life. I can enjoy God's people. I can worship him. 
with exactly what he's given me. Because he gives me his presence. He gives me his strength. He gives me his provision. He gives me his protection. I can do all these things. All the things he's asked me to do. So how are we content? It's a challenge for us. How are we content with God's current provision? We're not propping it up artificially with unneeded debt in our lives, but how can we be content with his provision in our lives? We usually look at our budgets and we think like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at the wants and the needs, but I want to I wanna scratch that language of needs from our budgeting process. Okay, this is getting real practical here. I want you to look at priorities. What are the wants? You get still have those in there because I want you to have fun with your money. What are your wants? But what are your priorities? See, our wants are some of our priorities, but we have to hold those in like kind of sober understanding in light of all of our other priorities. And so priorities are really the key. And when we, when we start really carefully looking at what all of our priorities are and, and choosing to spend our money on those things, then we can experience joy with our money because we're telling our money what to do, not the other way around. As we pay off debt, somebody else isn't telling us what to do with the money. We're supposed to be stewards, right? The, the original command is be fruitful and multiply. Take dominion and rule is what God told Adam and Eve to do to be stewards of his things and all the things he's provided. And so we need to tell our money what to do because we have made the priorities for what it's going to do. And so what's important? Jesus said for us to store up for ourselves treasures in heaven where thief cannot steal, where moth and rust doesn't destroy. And so he's talking about our relationship with God, our relationship with with our families, our friends, our church. Those are the treasures we are to store up for ourselves. So those should be our priorities. What, how can we use our money to support us worshiping God, desiring Him, and, and experiencing life to the full with those treasures around us? And you see that reflected in how the Jewish people lived. They spent their money on a whole bunch of parties not on interest, on debt service. <laughs> and so think about what's important. Prior, what are your priorities? I would suggest you put Jesus and his mission right at the top. And kind of side by side with that, you need to support your family. And that might need to go beyond just even like husband, wife, kids. But like, if you have aging parents, they need to be supported by your efforts too. And then think about your hobbies, your home, your friends. Last night, Alyssa and I got to go to like a worship night at someone's home. And they had a beautiful home and it was a big home. And when, I, when we complimented them on their home, they, they turned to us and they said, yeah, glory be to God that we have a place to worship like this, to worship in like this. They, he went, go, went on to go tell us a story of how when they were shopping for a house, they found this one and they, and they could visualize blowing out the back wall and expanding the living room space so that it could be big enough to host worship nights in their home. That's how you prioritize how you spend your money, with joy. And now they're experiencing this joy in the relationships of these people as they worship God. Right? Their desires are in all the right places. And so part of the message on money from the Bible is for us to enjoy it. For you to tell your money what to do, not the other way around. But it requires us to have the right master. Don't let money be your master. Don't don't step on the landmine of asking some other master to get you what you want, but live within the provision God has given you. Try to live with margin within that provision because of how you prioritize your life so that you can keep God first. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the ways that you provide for us. We thank you for 
giving us an experience of life that, that is joyous and joyful. We thank you that you have given us your word so we can experience freedom in all areas of our lives, spiritually and then everything else too. Father, we pray for freedom in our lives. We pray that we could be free from any other desires or any other masters that would take us away from you. And we pray that you would help us reprioritize our lives so that we could experience you and the joy that comes with that, so that we could experience life with our our friends, our family, our kids, that we wouldn't be missing out on, on something because we're beholden to some other master and so I'm not making my kids soccer game because I have to be at work. No, we want to experience joy. We want to experience life and life to the full. We want to, we want to invest in these relationships that are the treasures that you tell us last forever. So Father, bring us that kind of freedom. Amend our desires, Lord, so that we can experience life. We know that your great generosity towards us is what starts us on this road to freedom. And so we thank you today for Jesus. We thank you that he, that he died and rose again so that we can be forgiven, so that we no longer have to fear death or fear that we're, we're not getting enough or that we won't experience it all during, during our short time here on earth because we can experience you and all that joy for eternity when we put our trust in Jesus. And so today, Lord, we say, Jesus, we trust you with our future. We trust you for our provision. We trust you for, for protection. We trust you to be the source of our joy, Lord Jesus. And we pray all these things in your beautiful name. Amen.